Here's a question I got one time. God saved me. But with the background I've got, did he ever use me? The answer to that question will give you faith for living. This is Faith for Living with Dr. Mike Milton, an outreach of Trinity Chapel, Charlotte. Today, Dr. Milton brings the first part of the message, What God Starts, God Completes. Here now is Dr. Mike Milton. Some of the most memorable passages in Scripture stay with us generation after generation. Isn't it funny that, that your grandmother's favorite promises from the Word of God are yours and they're your children's? It's because they speak to the very heart of our human condition. Passages like, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want, or passages like Romans 8.28, which says all things work together for the good, or John 3.16, God so loved the world, he sent his only begotten Son, that whosoever would believe in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. What glorious, wonderful promises. I will never leave you or forsake you. Well, I want to give you another promise today, a promise which was a gift from the Apostle Paul to the Philippian church for a gift they had given, apparently a monetary gift that they had given to help another church. And so the Apostle Paul gives a gift. It's a gift of doctrine. If you ever thought doctrine was dry, dull, out of touch, academic, ivory tower, then you don't know the doctrine that's taught by Paul. For Paul, all doctrine is personal. All truth has relevancy. And so what Paul is going to give is a doctrine. And that doctrine is going to be the focus of our time today. A doctrine that I hope to describe, define, and a doctrine in the end that I pray you will delight in as I have. Because this doctrine changed my life. It is Philippians chapter 1. Paul writing from prison in Rome to the church at Philippi. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi with the overseers and deacons, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God in all my remembrance of you always in every prayer of mine for you all, making my prayer with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of the Lord will endure forever. Let us pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be always acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our Rock and our Redeemer. And let me preach as if never to preach again, as a dying man to dying men, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. I will never forget a moment in time at the first church that I planted in Kansas. We were in the midst of a building program, and we were actually having church inside of a building, a house that was under construction, 
going to become our new sanctuary. So there were I-beams on the floor, and there was dust all around, and there was uh, equipment. It was probably so dangerous we really shouldn't have met there. But we had Sunday school, and and uh, in spite of all of this, I was trying to bring a dignity to the pulpit and a hope to the people that one day we would actually have a sanctuary. So I, I put on my robe and, and uh, uh, my academic hood uh, to make it as colorful and worshipful as possible, and we had a pulpit there and a communion table, but it was really a construction mess. And I was going from Sunday school where I had taught a new members class, rushing to get ready to pray with the elders, to go up and uh, to begin the service, and really in a hurry, when all of a sudden I felt a tug on my robe. And I looked down, and there was this little fellow, and he was waving a piece of colorful construction paper. And I patted him on the head, and I said, nice, nice boy, Sonny. And I kept moving, and he kept pulling at the robe, and I finally turned around and looked at him. And he held up his piece of construction paper. And apparently his teacher had helped him to cut out a picture of yellow construction equipment, and he, he had taken Elmer's glue and glued it on this piece of construction paper, and uh, then there were sprinkles or sparkles all over it, you know the way they do. And then on top, he had made with letters with the sprinkles and sparklers and with the Elmer's glue, he had written, please be patient with me. God is not finished with me yet. And then underneath it said, under construction. And in small letters he had written, Philippians 1.6. He who has begun the good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. At that moment, I threw away my sermon that I had prepared, and I knew God had delivered a new sermon to me through that little boy. Little did I know that years later, still planting a church, I would need what that little boy brought me. I would need that doctrine that I call what God starts, God completes. She had come into the life of our church, and the truth is she didn't look anything like our church in an upper-middle-income suburban congregation, meeting in a school gymnasium, planting a church. In comes a lady that uh, maybe some would have described as a motorcycle mama. She didn't look like she belonged there. And a lot of eyes turned and looked to see her. After the service, I was greeting people, and she came to me. And she told me, she said, I think I've been saved. I said, you think you've been saved? She said, well, I heard you on the radio, and I came to the service, and uh, let me get this right. If you repent of your sins and trust in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, and seek to follow Him, He forgives you. Is that right? That's what you said? I said, yes, ma'am. That's, that's right. She said, well, I think I want to join your church. I said, well, I think we'd like to have you. We began a conversation that led to a decision that she should come to our home on Monday nights, and my wife, May, and I would disciple her for a series of about eight to ten evenings on the basics of the Christian faith, on, on, on Scripture and on worship, uh, on witnessing. And we would move through the principles of the foundations of the Christian life. Several Monday nights into that, the knock came on the door. As we anticipated, it was time for her to come. And I uh, opened the door, and she was weeping. In fact, she was heaving tears. 
and I thought she'd been in an automobile accident. And I welcomed her in because she was shaking. And I hugged her, and my wife heard the commotion, and she came over, and she hugged her, and we're trying to protect her from whatever had sought to harm her. And I said, what is it? And she couldn't quite get it out because of the tears and because of the emotion pouring forth out of her. And finally she said, God saved me, but he can never use me. And I said, sit down. My wife brought coffee and we got her to calm down. And I said, now, now let me hear this again. What is it that is troubling you? She said, I'm just realizing that I'm nothing like you. I'm nothing like your people, your flock. I don't belong in your church. Because, you see, you don't know my past. And you don't know the pain of my past that is gripping me. And you don't understand the things that I have done. And, Pastor, you don't understand the things that have been done to me. And when I look at your congregation and I see husbands actually putting their arms around their wives and showing care and gentleness toward their wives, it strikes me because I have never known that sort of gentleness from any man toward me. God saved me, but he can never use me. And I remembered that construction paper, and I remember... I remembered the saying, please be patient with me. And I remembered my Aunt Eva's words, which described the doctrine that I wanted to give her, that Paul gave to the Philippian church. What God starts, God completes. I had her to sit down, and I turned to her and I said, Let me tell you a story. I said, once there was an alcoholic, aging naval officer whose career was washed up from wine, women, and song. His career was to the point where he was actually sent to a hospital in New Orleans, Louisiana, and there he was to dry out. He met at that place a half-breed Choctaw Indian with a thir third-grade education from Mississippi. Didn't have a thing in common, but one thing, their sin and their loss and their grief. And out of that, a child was born. Before that child was born, a decision was made that it would be better for all if the child were aborted. The father said, if you will bring the child to term, the father said, I'll take the child and I'll somehow raise the baby. And so the agreement was made that she would bring the child to term, and then the aging alcoholic naval officer, career now ruined, never having been a father before, now in his 50s, would have a baby. She was drying her tears as she continued to listen to me and as I continued the story. I told her that the father brought the baby and took the baby, had the baby baptized at a church where he was going trying to get his life back together. But he realized he had to go back to sea and another arrangement was made and he actually asked the mother of the child to take the child. But the schizophrenia which had set him from alcoholism was too much and uh, the end of that whole story was when the child was tied up in a doghouse, a baby, and the police found the baby. 
the father called in from sea, and at that point he took the baby, the corpse supporting him, and placed the baby into the arms of his sister, who was 65 years of age, recently widowed, and had never had children of her own. And all of a sudden, at 65, she was the mother of a nine-month-old. And on a little chicken farm on the Louisiana-Mississippi border, she and that little boy would begin their lives together. He had a sort of Huck Finn existence. There were rivers to cross and dogs to chase and cows to feed fish to catch, good life. They didn't have a car. They caught a ride to go to church wherever they could. There was a little tabernacle right down the road that met on Wednesday nights. There were only three groups of Christians in this small, unincorporated rural area. There were Baptist, Methodist, and there were disgruntled Baptist, Methodist. That was the third group. And on Wednesday night, that group met. And the boy's aunt would go down and then would bring the boy to hear the singing and the preaching of a plumber by day and a preacher by night by the name of Brother Duvall that she felt had the Holy Spirit resting on him. And then she would walk home. But while there, she would pray for her brother the alcoholic, the boy's father, that he would be healed, that he would be saved. And in fact, the little boy would never forget that congregation gathered in that piney wood, rough-hewn tabernacle chapel, praying the name of his father. One evening, the little boy and his aunt finally took a stroll with the boy's father, who was cajoled, if not convinced, by his sister, you need to be there on Wednesday night. They've been praying for you. The little boy would never forget seeing, as Brother Duvall began preaching in that piney pulpit, he would never forget it would become indelibly imprinted upon his conscience. The sight of his alcoholic father, whom he just knew is sick and dying, dropping to his knees in the sawdust and crying like a baby and asking God to forgive him and to save him. At that moment, the prayers of that congregation were answered, and the prayers of that boy's aunt were answered. Brother Duvall came down out of the piney pulpit, walked through the sawdust, and knelt down with the boy's father, and all of that happened right around the boy. It was frightening. It was surreal. And it was like heaven come down. And that father was saved. In just a few months, the boy would see an unusually cold spring Louisiana rain coming down on a gray coffin being lowered into the ground. And his identity as an orphan would be complete. During that time, there had been a coming and going of the boy's biological mother, which brought pain and even kidnapping and beating and abuse. So that by the age of four, the little boy was asking questions four-year-old boy shouldn't ask. When will the nightmare be over? And so the aunt began her work of healing, finding a way to go to a church, bringing Christ to that little child, holding the child in her lap so that he would hear the scriptures 
being read from her voice, her heart beating and feeling as if Jesus Christ was right there. I'm telling this story to this young woman. By this time, she was drying the last of her tears, and she was looking with great intent. The boy, I told her, was taught the scriptures. He saw Christ in his aunt. But he had great, deep, visceral, existential questions in his life that begin to emerge as a child moves into adolescence. Who am I? Why am I here? Where am I going? I told her, as I was telling the story, that the little boy, now an adolescent, took those existential questions to the great theologians he knew about. He took them to people at church and he didn't get any answers. So he took them to the only theologians he knew. Neil Young, Bob Dylan, the birds, Jackson Brown. Good singers, good music, sometimes bad theology and bad answers for a boy searching for home and an identity. Those answers were not the answers that were so close to him, that is, the answers that his aunt would have given him. His aunt, who was the only mother he knew. The answers were as close as Brother Duvall in the Piney Wood pulpit. The answers were as close as the heartbeat and the scripture that he heard while sitting on the lap of his aunt. But the deep, dark strains of the 1960s began to replace the heartbeat of his aunt and the voice of his aunt. And it was not so much that this boy went into rebellion, as we sometimes call it in, in adolescence, as he went on a search, a journey. And as he went on that journey, he literally left home. He literally left with the scene of this aunt crying on the porch and saying, son, you're going to come home, but when you come home, you're going to be broken. It wasn't a chastisement of the boy. It was a tearful warning, almost a prophecy, if you will, from this woman of God, this woman of prayer. As the boy went off, and left her in his teens, his early teens. He was out in the world. And along the way in the world, he lost much. He sinned, and he was sinned against. He entered into unlawful relationships, and he paid the price of broken relationships. He was in the veritable hog pen of life. He began to cry out to try to find a way home. He cried out to the God of his aunt. He cried out to the God he had known as a child. Oh God, how do I get home? And after all that I have gone through, how do I come to you? The answer that he found was religion. A religion that he began to understand said, if you do this, you can be holy enough to earn your way to God. 
And so he began to do those things. He, he joined a church. He joined another church. He tried several different religions. His life was falling apart on one hand, and on the other hand, he was trying to make himself holy. He even figured if you go through four or five Saturday mornings of learning how to preach, you can be a lay preacher and get a little thing, a little piece of paper sign that says you're a lay preacher. And I mean, after all, if you're seeking holiness, that's the best way to do it, right? To become a lay preacher if you're not a preacher. And that failed. He found himself at the point of desperation. And that was about the time that he laid his head back on the lap of his aunt. And her prophecy, as it were, came true. And he returned a broken boy, unable to find his way home. And with his head on her lap, now in his early twenties, she stroked his hair, the hair of a boy who had been on a long prodigal journey for many years. And she said, what I taught you as a child is still the truth that you need. What God starts, God will complete. Dr. Milton, I was just wondering what happened to the lady who went into your home and you told her your story. Well, I'm glad you asked that. There are times and places where I unfold what happened to all the people in my life, including that young lady. In the case of this young lady, she became a Sunday school teacher. Uh, she came before me and I married her to her husband. And on my last day, uh, at that church, as I was being called to another ministry, I baptized her child. And I'll never forget that during this time, the congregation was standing singing a baptismal hymn as I was holding her baby in the arms, her husband next to me, and she began crying. And I whispered over to her that those were Philippians 1, 6 tears, what God starts. God completes. This has been Faith for Living with Dr. Michael Milton, coming to you from Trinity Chapel in Charlotte, a parish church for the Weddington area of South Charlotte in the Presbyterian and Reformed tradition, gathering, growing, and sending forth strong disciples of Jesus Christ through word, sacrament, and prayer. If you'd like to know more about Dr. Milton and the ministry of Trinity Chapel Charlotte, visit our website at faithforliving.net. Well, thanks for being with us today, and we hope you'll join us again next week as Dr. Michael Milton teaches us how we can have faith for living.